Okay, everyone, I'm just mindful of time. I'm supposed to be starting now. So, and I want to finish on the hour so that I have plenty of time for questions. Okay, come in. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Kerry Lee Lockyer. I am a lecturer in applied linguistics at the University of South Australia. And I um, am a part of this really interesting research project with an associate professor in law, Sarah Moulds, and a PhD candidate, Marie Ackhurst, who is doing her PhD in applied linguistics on the future of work. Um, we came to this project, Sarah and I, uh, through a uh, community of practice uh, on belonging. So we're really interested in student belonging. And we also had a role on our governance forum at the university where we were given some documents that were supposed to help facilitate student representatives at um, UniSA in their governance practices. So these documents were for students and for staff members. You may be familiar with these documents if you've ever been on a governance um, forum at a university, because quite a few other universities in Australia have similar documents. They're kind of like how-to guides or handbooks, things like that on you know, how to do being a part of whatever committee it is that you're on. So I just want to show you a little snapshot of one of these, from one of these kinds of documents. And I want you to have a look and have a read and tell me who you think this document is for. Is it for staff or students on the committee? It's a bit blurry because I've de-identified it. So. Hear a few giggles. Have you figured it out yet? Who's it for? Students. And how quickly did you realize that? So we don't really tell staff members, for instance, um, who are coming into uh, a role on academic board to not slouch or look disinterested or put their head on the table um, or not to interrupt or speak over other people, which I have been in some decision-making places where professors do do that, which is funny. Uh, but, you know, lo and behold, this, is, uh, this isn't just something that we sort of hold up and say, this is interesting or funny or not great, but rather um, as an applied linguist, I looked at this um, and I thought, what are the assumptions that are underlying documents like this about who students are and what they're bringing to decision-making processes at the university? And this led us on a journey of looking at governance from this light. So why this matters is because I'm sure I'm speaking to the choir here in some kind of way that we all recognize that governance is a really important part of universities for all these different reasons. We've got um, student retention, student learning outcomes, student recruitment, student health and wellbeing, student participation. These are all things that are talked about, considered on the agendas of decision-making forums across Australia. And a lot of the charters or the rules and regulations that actually govern these spaces say that they have to have a student representative in these spaces to be a part of these conversations. The issue that uh, comes up time and time again in the literature and also anecdotally is that students who are a part of these processes either none are volunteer for it or when they are there, they don't say anything, they're not genuinely a part of the decision-making process. So this uh, raises a question about how are students and staff members conceptualised in the documents that inform governance processes? Another way of thinking about that is how do these documents that sort of move and shape governance at universities, what are they saying about staff and students from the outset? How are they defining the roles and the expectations of people within these places and spaces? So the aim of our research is to investigate how these conceptualizations across universities in Australia, we can then for explore the broader institutional discourses that are shaping the way students and staff are repositioned, redefined, disenabled in these governance processes. You notice I've done this funny thing that we tend to do in applied linguistics, which is we, we hold terms really lightly. So when I talk about position or positioned, it, this can equally be repositioned. When I talk about definitions or define, this can also be redefined or and so forth with enabling. When we enable, we can also disenable. So terms and processes 
can be really fuzzy and really hard to hold on to, even when they're written down. Whoopsie daisy. So the approach that we've taken is we're following um, a public discourse analysis approach. And there's three key steps that we've taken in the data collection. We selected um, these highly ranked universities according to the QS rankings. University of Queensland, University of Sydney, ANU, Macquarie, University of Melbourne, and we chucked our own university in there as well. Uh, I'm not saying that we're highly ranked or not, uh, whatever. Uh, my boss is not here. The University of South Australia. Uh, so we've gathered all of the publicly accessible university governance documents that we could from public, publicly available places of these universities. We've performed a thematic discourse analysis with a focus on the language used to describe the roles and responsibilities and relationships between key actors in these documents. So you think key actors, staff, students, but a key actor that tends to also come up in these documents are the university themselves. So they tend to be talked about in these documents as a actor. Then we, uh, we've we we've looked at the way that this, uh, these conceptualizations or categories, um, how these travel within these documents. So this is using an approach called membership categorization analysis. And this is a useful way to look at the way that uh, linguistic and contextual features come together to position these members or categories. I'll speak a little more about that in a minute because it is a key approach. So People, organizations, events, interactions, and moments are shaped by and understood through categories. Um, but we inherit these categories in our language and in the language of the institutions that we find ourselves in. And these are often precasting who people are and their relationships with each other in ways that are often invisible to us. So by taking a focus on categorization, we can have a look at the way that the category work that happens in texts and in, and in interactions is seen to be logical or normative in those spaces. So this is a bird's eye view of all the publicly accessible documents that we've gathered and how they fit in certain kinds of genres or groupings that to, uh, typify that document and these are the documents that we selected that shape and are mentioned and used around governance forums at university. So the selection of these documents are such that they are interrelated so they mention each other so there's relationships between them and they are also textual because they yeah they're used in these governance forums. So I'll just give you some examples this is from the University of Queensland data set so the legislation that tends to be invoked is like this kind of University of Queensland Act, for instance, that bestows powers upon the governance bodies. This then gets uh, referenced in things like university framework, strategic direction, and they can be talked about in this kind of way, that the governance framework applies to the whole of the university and to its equivalent, and that there's like this mandatory aspect to it. So there's the power. These then can come up in the terms of reference and procedures of the governance forum that is being, um, you know, that you may focus on. So, and this is where you might have something said like a one representative of the HDR candidates is appointed by the UQ Association of Postgraduate Students. And this is where the student representative body tends to come in as well. And their ways of talking about the governance forum can come up in these processes very clearly because it's an important role of a lot of these student representative organizations. Then we have these support resources, these how-to guides, these handbooks that are supposed to help people actually navigate this space and make sense of all these documents and texts. So this is from a student perspective document. So a handbook guide for students. So they're saying things like, be prepared, be broad, be brave. This is your chance to have your voice heard. There's always exclamation marks in these documents as well, something else that I've noticed. Uh, so a student representative is elected or nominated to represent a broader, broader student cohort to act on their behalf and to ensure the student voice is heard. This is from a staff uh, document. Being a student rep is ultimately about helping others and working as a team. Nice. Now we've got one that's normally 
created for the group as a whole. So like academic Senate handbook guide for all members of that, um, uh, that group. So this is where something along the lines of this is stated, ensuring that board members understand their responsibilities as trustees of the university and not as delegates of their faculty, academic unit, professional staff, or the student body. You may see already what's emerging here, even from this bird's eye view perspective, is different uh, interpretations of these texts in terms of what the role of the student rep is actually supposed to be in this forum, in this space. So if we have a look at a text in detail and how these membership categories travel within the text. Uh, so I'm zooming in on a document that was created for the University of South Australia. You see students are positioned as the mentees here. So they have to uh, become engaged. So in other words, they weren't engaged before. Uh, they are also there to learn much in the same way that they may learn as a student in the learning context and staff on the other side of that as the partner the pair of this category they are the mentors and the teachers because if a student is there in this mentee capacity then the staff member is there to be the mentor and the teacher and you can see that in the way that this document talks about it's actually here specifically saying mentoring and learning development Equally, there's this notion of students are outsiders. They're on the outside of the university and they have to be welcomed in to gain a sense of belonging and investment about the university. In other words, staff are considered to already have this in place. That's always the flip side to it. Okay, whoops. So if students are not just mentees, they also have other commitments. This needs to be actually written out in documents like this that, you know, students have to decide between studying for an exam and attending a meeting. They're actually going to prioritise things that are important to them and that they have this high complex set of priorities to manage their time. And if staff are the mentors and the teachers, then they need to also recognise that if a student doesn't come to a decision-making forum, that it's not because they're disinterested or a bad student. Students are outsiders and are unfamiliar with the role, so this is where they may have to take um, steps in which to show that there is no ambiguity about your role, that you need to explicitly state why students should be there and what value they bring. So the assumptions that are underlining un underlying these documents are that students are therefore outsiders and unfamiliar with the context need to be made to feel belonging and that staff are going to have a very important part of that process of ensuring that they are going to facilitate the belonging for students, okay? So across the documents, when we looked at it from that bird's eye perspective, the interrelated and the textual perspective, we see that there emerges from these governance documents multiple student representatives. So even though the form student representative is the same, the meaning doesn't always travel with that form. So we see them being positioned as a change agent, an advocate, a voice to be heard. This is just an example of this being stated. So remember the overarching goal of the SRC is to make Macquarie what you want it to be, exclamation mark. Uh, sorry, student representative, a conduit of the student body. So someone who's just there and the student body comes with them, right? So to be a representative of your faculty's cohort and improve the university experience. So just you being there improves the university experience. Members of the SRC will be democratically elected by students and therefore uh, it's, you know, a representative in that kind of sense. So it's student representative working with academic staff and other university members to achieve common goals. So the board is composed primarily of academics who are representative of the academic diversity in the university. And then we have, it also includes students as junior colleagues. So you can see the positioning there again of students in relationship to staff members and academics and that they provide an important venue for student involvement in the academic decision-making. A member of the governance forum working towards the best interests of the university. This is also a very common way 
of talking about student representatives, that there's this expectation that they're going to act in good faith in the best interests of the academic senate and the university. So what our research um, I think is revealing as we trace the student and staff um, categories through these texts, categories are co-created in situ, so with others, and it's always in context. So you can, can't really understand what student means and also what staff member means unless you're considering the context and the other social actors that are involved in that context. So therefore students can be learners and mentees and staff uh, teachers and mentors. Um, you can see even in texts where there may not be specifically um, stated that student is a mentee, you can see it in texts that say things like this, the power difference between committee members and student rep representatives can make it difficult to speak in meetings. A little bit further along, there's another sentence in between that. I got rid of it. Sorry. Disagreeing with someone on a committee will not negatively impact on your on your degree. So this is where you can see there's like this tension that's occurring when you have a student who's on a academic committee. They're being told, you're a student representative in this context. That means X, Y, and Z. But they're sitting in a room with people who have the power to make decisions about their degree and about their, you know, potential futures. You can't just say, well, that's being pushed aside because it's their reality. And it needs, and it, you see it, how it's actually explicitly stated in some of these documents. Student skills developed relate to career support and development as well as mentoring. So again, a lot of the benefits that get uh, presented to student representatives is that they're going to learn skills. It's better for your career. Uh, you can put it on your CV. You know, it's great for your job outcomes, etc. We've got the position of clients buying a product and staff producing that product. Um, this is in some documents in the way that uh, the university is the role of the university is positioned as not being designed for things like job training, but the uni is a place to teach people how to learn. Um, sorry for shouting at you, uh, <laughs> but this is how it was presented in the text and I think the meaning of it would be lost if I'd taken out the caps. So advocates and activists pushing for change and staff are the ones that need to change. Your voice matters. I thought about shouting it, but I won't. As a class representative, you are seen as a leader who can speak and share the experiences of your course. When you speak, the university must listen. So you can see there the, the sort of role of activist and agent there being bestowed on the student. Regulated and staff are regulated and regulators for students. I need to unpack this a little bit because um, I think it's an important point. So when students are regulated, so you can think of TEXO, you can think of all these different legislations that get put on place and filter down through into course curriculum, course learning outcomes, all that sort of stuff. Students are regulated in that sense. Staff also are regulated too, but they are also the regulators of students. So um, this is a, just an example of it coming up in these texts. So your focus should be on auditing the course to ensure that it is consistent with university policy. Consider what contributes to the student learning experience, capital letters, and how you can provide feedback on each component to enhance it. So what's the upshot here? So far, we can say um, that these texts are representative of the way governance documents across universities in Australia, cast how staff and students are repositioned, redefined and disenabled. And at a minimum, we believe that this raises questions of what student engagement, roles and expectations do we need in governance? What is practically possible? What changes would need to be made in order to enable this? And how could these be developed and implemented in ways that include student voice? whatever that means. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. Anyway, our next steps, we have this real blue sky initiative where we really want to have an extension of our research to include the ways that staff and students navigate these decision-making forums. 
Um, and we're going to be seeking partners for that next stage of our research. So this is just the first stage of a aspirational change for the way that we make decision making possible at university. Thank you. Any question? Yes. Um, thank you so much. This is part of like discomfort and fascination and like motivation to go back and think about what we write about this. Um, I'm just interested in the context of a merger. Yes. Do you have any guidance to how the new government got to you know you've got an opportunity to kind of say and how you yep. Um, so I'd like to bring in my boss to, no, I'm joking. <laughs> Sorry, someone else, someone else got the boss in to talk to the, I wish I could bring the vice chancellor in. Uh, yeah. So the merger, for those of you who don't know about South Australian politics, um, my colleague from Flinders watching, um, <laughs> maybe from your institution. So University of South Australia and the University of Adelaide are coming together and creating a new university called Adelaide University. And of course, this is a massive process of, you can imagine just how crazy it is and how much work is being done to get this up and running by 1st of January, 2026. One of those things is governance processes. We are at an early stage being invited to be a part of this process, myself and the team. Um, and one of the first steps into that process is uh, like, for instance, next week, I'm a part, I'm presenting at another conference for ASRs jointly between Adelaide Uni and UniSA. Um, and also, uh, so my, my academic unit paid for me to be here. So they, they paid for my flights and everything. They're very supportive of this entire endeavor that we're going through. And a part of that was that we're going to be presenting this research back to the leaders at our university. So we'll see where it goes. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Um, Thank you. My name's Bridget. I'm the manager of Donuts. Um, Hi, Bridget. Bridget. Yep. I bet. Um, I like to be involved in this. Yep. Um, we're at the at the moment, or I'm actually at the moment, get the reference group to revise those documents that we're doing. Um, I would love to be involved. See, there we go. Already. Yay. Woo. Thanks, Bridget. Uh, sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, so, how much do you congratulate you on this research? Because that was my defining thing that led me into this work in the beginning, too, was, was chairing our academic board. And having eight students who didn't know what they were doing. Yes. With them, and so many times when I get student voice to university managers, whatever they say, oh, we have some research, we have research for that. Yes, and yep. We, and we consult, <laughs> and we have people. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and my big question was, what do you do with all of that? Mm. So I think this is, this is a great project, and I'd like to see that that gets disseminated around. Thank you. Thank you. We're working on it. Thank you very much. I think what why this is working for us, because we had a different perspective at the beginning. We were going to move straight into looking at the way staff and students just interact in these spaces. Um, but it was very hard to get through into that stage of our research because it was seen as like an evaluation. And I really hope that this shows I'm not evaluating these documents. I'm not evaluating the hard work that USASA did to create these handbooks or these how-to guides. Rather, I'm trying to reveal the underlying assumptions that are there about staff and students to show that if this is what we think, this is what the documents are saying we're thinking about staff and students. So we either accept that this is the way the world is, this is the university's worldview, or we challenge it and we try to change it. So I, I guess that's what we're trying to do at the moment. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. No. Yeah, I agree. If if my students don't know what my lecture was all about, that's on me. <laughs> For instance, I think about that in my teaching and I think we can think about that in governance. So, sorry, there was another question. Um, 
Computer is my uh, my part. This is stuff with age measure to see the growth of the box. Yes. Right. Yeah. Oh well we, we we welcome involvement. Thank you. I have to ask thank you. I think great. Just about two things. First of all, the, the universe is a new plugin for that review. Mm -hmm. Is there a on that because I don't feel to pay it through the request to the universe? Yeah. We yeah. We we chose them because something that anecdotally happens when uh governance forums are coming up with new terms of reference and things like that is that they sort of steal from other universities they go to another university and think oh university of sydney did this in this structured way so let's see we will just take that and do that so there was there was a bit of that in selecting those particular organizations also it's a huge corpus already but i recognize i want to have yeah. you know for instance representation from yeah yeah, UniSA is technically a regional university as well, but I recognise, you know, we we would like to include universities from other states as well. We haven't got some friends from Perth yet. We haven't got a friend from the Northern Territory or, or Tasmania in that list. So we definitely are going to include them. Um, and, yeah, that's the first my RA is probably hearing about that. So she's... <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's an ongoing thing. But thank you for that. What was your other thing? Thank you. Thanks for your perspective. Any other questions? Yes. What do you do when the staff members have a question? It's struggles that you found being a part of the and don't like it when students have to do with them, try to actively make it harder for them to do with them. Yeah, I wish I had a good answer for that, but I don't, <laughs> because uh, that that was something that we would like to look into is how the interactions within these decision making forums then are shaped by these documents. I can anecdotally speak to and also draw on my other applied linguistic research around professionals making decisions together, that in certain spaces where there's huge power divides, just asking a question like you would be encouraged to do in a different context, in that context can be seen as, you know, potentially disrespectful or, you know, not allowed in that part of whatever forum you're a part of. So I think it's really important to recognise that all these spaces are interactive spaces, which means you're managing not just what people are saying, the content, the agenda, the text that you have, maybe you've written a little speech about something that you're going to actually be speaking to on the on that academic board for that day. But there's also just the fact that you're also performing in that space. You want to give your best self. You have like face issues that you're trying to manage at the same time. There's so much going on there, not just for you, but for everyone else in the room as well, that um, 
for for us to sort of just completely disregard all those issues and say, well, you can just ask a question whenever you like is I don't think getting to the heart of what the issue is. So thank you for your question. Sorry, I don't have advice for you. Yes. Yeah, I would like to have research to back it up, but I know anecdotally in my position working on academic board and also I was my, uh, the HDR representative on the research school board when I was a PhD student. And I know that there are instances where work does, it goes really well. And I think it comes down to a lot of the time, re the relational aspect of the staff student relationship. So I felt comfortable enough in that space because my academic supervisor was on the board and also I knew the chair very well. He took a lot of time to get to know me. So I was felt really confident to put my ideas forward and they were acted on and I was a part of that process and it, and it worked well. I think um, this is where the next stage of our research is really important is that we actually get some best practice examples of where things go well because it's really easy to point to the, when things go wrong <laughs> but I think if we can look at instances where it goes well and how staff and students actually push and push back and draw on these kinds of documents that are shaping that interaction, then we can get a sense for how we can move forward. Thank you. Okay. I think it's lunch. You guys all hungry? Me too. Right. All right. Well, I'm, I'm happy to have a chat with anyone who has more questions, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here.